Good evening, everybody. Today we are in the midst of our 10 days of awe, the 10 days of repentance starting with Rosh Hashanah, which began last Wednesday evening, and will end with Kol Nidre on Friday evening through breakfast Saturday night. It is the holiest period for Jews, and yet we are also commemorating the one-year anniversary of the tragedy of October 7th, when Hamas terrorists killed, abducted, and tortured over a thousand people from as many as 40 countries. The events of October 7th surged anti-Semitism around the world, which had already been growing over the past decade. In many countries, including the United States, as political developments saw far-right groups leveraging anti-Semitism to grow their parties, while with electoral success in France, Hungary, Germany, the US and others, while left-wing groups surge in anti-Semitic hate, especially since October 7th. We're also only a few weeks away from the 86th anniversary of Kristallnacht, the night of November 9th and 10th, 1938, when German Nazis attacked Jewish persons and property. The name Kristallnacht refers to the litter of broken glass left in the streets after these pogroms. The violence continued during the day of November 10th, and in some places, acts of violence continued for several more days. My name is Irvin Varconi. I'm chair of the FJMC Committee to Combat Anti-Semitism. And this evening, we are now to have with us the co-authors of Untermenschen. Dr. Arthur Flug has served as the executive director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College and as director of instructional management systems for the New York City Board of Education. His career includes a record of public service as district administrator for U.S. Congressman Gary Ackerman and as chief of staff for the chair of the New York City Finance Committee, David Weprin. Lou Grumet is the author of two books, The Curious Case of Curious Joel, concerning a church state case for which he was the plaintiff in 1994, and This Land is My Land concerning a Mohawk armed takeover of state property in New York in which he was the state negotiator and did the dispute. He was also the executive director of the New York State School Boards Association for 14 years, as well as the New York State Society of Certified Public Accountants for 12 years. So, uh, Arthur and Lou, thank you so much for uh, joining this evening. Could you tell us about yourselves and how you came to collaborate on the book? Yeah, um, I have a background that I started off in education. I was a teacher in the city school system. I left that, I became chief of staff for US congressman, then chief of staff for New York City Councilman. And I retired and a week later, I found myself as director of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center. Uh, it was something that attracted me, attracted my attention. I was brought up with a strong feeling of being Jewish and what it meant to be Jewish, uh, especially uh, community service and civil justice. Um, Lou and I live in the same apartment building and we met one day and we started talking about six years ago and we began talking about what is happening today in the Jewish community, in the United States, in the New York City, and we began talking about a project. And as a result, with both our backgrounds, we put together this program. The one thing I want to point out as we start that we looked for something to have a governance function that would give us direction. And I've taught the Holocaust for 10 years until I retired in 2007. And one of the things that began jumping out at me, and I mentioned this to Lou, was it seemed there was a mistake in teaching the Holocaust. And that is that most people, if you ask them, tell me about the Holocaust, they will say six million Jews were killed. And if you ask them a year later to talk about the Holocaust, they will say, yeah, six million Jews were killed. Basically, if you take all the other facts they have, it's just thrown in. 
it needed some meaning. So the approach we developed was 6 million Jews were killed in the Holocaust and 70 million Germans thought it was necessary. With that approach, we've made the Holocaust a hate crime. And we'll talk about that as we go on. Thank Lou? You. Lou? My, my, my approach is just from the other end. I, I was raised as, as one of two Jewish kids in, in a small town in West Virginia. It was a large steel town. And the nicest thing somebody would ever say to me if they wanted to compliment me is I wasn't like other Jews. And any of us who grew out outside of the New York bubble understands that. Of course, they didn't know any other Jews. But um, but I, I spent most of my career doing civil rights related things. Uh, I'm a child of the 60s. Uh, I, uh, I very much worked on and created the New York State Program for Handicapped Children that some 300,000 kids are part of in schools today. And I got to see the way they were treated. And I was from the Upper South and I went to school in Washington, DC and I got to see the way blacks were treated. And for most of my life, as Artie and I have talked about many times, after World War II, people may have whispered about anti-Semitism, but they didn't really talk about it like they do today. And so as Artie and I began to talk about the fact that we had never really explained to our younger generation what the Holocaust really was, it's beginning to fade. We decided we wanted to do two things. We wanted to, to create a book built around Holocaust survivors who were teenagers when this happened to them. We tend to think of Holocaust survivors as being in their 80s or 90s, and they are. But the people we talked to who were all in their 90s were all preteens or teenagers when they were in Auschwitz and Theresienstadt and Dachau. And we thought that we, if we could get them to, to let us tell their stories to young people, that Anne Frank wasn't the only teenager out there. Uh, there were hundreds of thousands, if not millions of them. The other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to use the word untermenschen for the book even though we were well aware of the fact that our very audience wouldn't know what intervention was. But for those who don't know what intervention is, it's a German word meaning less than human, the opposite of Ubermenschen, meaning Superman, uh, that Nietzsche developed. And the Nazis used Untermenschen to describe Jews and Blacks and gays and disabled, who they wanted to put out of existence. And we wanted to use that term so that if people understood it, they would understand that the real problem isn't somebody yelling in a college debate. The real college is the way people treat each other and sometimes treat whole groups of people, not sometimes, historically treat whole groups of people as intermention. And I'm a history nut and already wanted to focus on the actual people and I wanted to focus on the thousand years of anti-Semitism that give the context for how the Nazis did what they did. Right. And so Thank both you. of it, and we both did it. We both went our separate ways and brought it together. Uh, maybe, maybe, Lou, you want to go the, the history background well, that you, you talked about in Europe. Or oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You want to say yeah. something? Let's, we, have, we had some questions some people had sent in and some others. And uh, if, if the questions aren't raising all that, please do feel free to add uh, to them. Okay. I also wanted to just uh, call out uh, my good friend and past FJMC president, Alan Cahan, uh, who had, we had the good fortune for him to be related to author as a first cousin once removed, and he brought our attention to this. So thank you, uh, past president Cahan, uh, for that. Um, let's start with the, the pictures. So for those of you that not have seen the book, uh, obviously, feel free to order the book. It is by that name, and it was just uh, recently published. But let me uh, share my screen, because one of the things that you'll find in this book are these amazing and wonderful pictures. So can you tell us a little bit about these pictures, Arthur and uh, and Lou? Um, this I yes. took a few from the book, what yeah. these are. Uh, this is what we call dumb luck. Oh, one day I received a call at the Holocaust Center, oh, about a dozen years ago, from a woman in Jersey saying that her grandfather died. He was a Holocaust survivor. 
they're selling the house, they're cleaning out the garage, and they found the stack of pictures in the garage under tops and a lot of other stuff. Uh, they don't see any meat for them. They're going to throw them out. But uh, someone said uh, uh, they know Arthur Flug at the Holocaust Center in Queens. Call him. And she called me. Um, I said, well, I want to come out. She said, you got to come out today. Because if you don't come out today, we're putting it out for garbage. And I drove out there and I looked at them. And there were two dozen pictures. Uh, the name of the artist, now we come back here, is Seymour Kaftan. Um, he's not known as an artist until we found these pictures. I looked at them and said, they're beautiful. Uh, what, what do you want from them? She said, no, if you don't take them, I'm putting them out. And so I just loaded them in the car, brought them back to the Holocaust Center, uh, met with some artists on campus. We reframed them and we opened it up as an exhibit that went around the country. Uh, what is great about this it is almost like primitive painting, but when you look at it, the colors and the action and the words underneath that were in Yiddish that we translated when we did the exhibit that you have in the book tell you a story about the Jews of Vilna and what started off as a quiet background developed into the Holocaust. That's that's basically what they did, but we were both taken by the the intensity of the color and, and the drama that it has. And, and something else we wanted to do, I mean, th this these pictures, and they're, they're all in the book, these pictures are the story of this man's life. When he got to America, he wouldn't talk about the Holocaust, but he painted these the story. He painted the years he was in a basement hiding. He painted the years he was in a slave camp as a teenager. He painted the years when he was sent to Ponary. Now, my great-grandmother came from Vilna, and I never heard of Ponary. When you think of, of, of the Holocaust, you think of Poland and you think of the Germans and what they did. But it was all over Europe, and Ponary was, was a death camp. It was a forest, but it was a death camp. And these pictures are not only beautiful, but they're haunting. When you see them, you get to see through his eyes what he lived through for four years as a teenager. Here he is hiding, hiding under the basement before the Germans found him. And uh, it's it's hard. We don't really live the lives these people lived. It's unbelievable what they went through. And God help us, we can't let it ever happen again. So, but I added some, this picture here, this is enough uh, from it, that what we saw in the earlier, those uh, watercolors and what we see today. How how does it feel, Arthur and, and Lou? And you've you've spoken to survivors. How do they feel when they see a picture like this, given that they may have been among the Jews who were in hiding? How how do they talk to you about this? Okay, uh, we start off the book with a phone call that I got from one of the survivors. Her name was Hani Liebman. Hani, uh, when we started working on the book, was. 97. I spoke to her two days ago when she invited me to her 100th birthday on Thanksgiving. Her, when she called me, it was January 6th, and she was crying. We be, we're good friends, and we keep together. Uh, I do with several of the surviving people who are survivors. And she was crying, and she says, Arthur, I've seen this before. I've seen this in Germany. It's here. And she kept saying, the Nazis are here. The Nazis are here. And at first, I didn't know what she was saying. But then I looked. I was sitting in front of the TV screen, seeing what was happening. And I understood just what she said. Um, that became the starting point. Uh, we met with a group of survivors, very vocal, very well-spoken survivors, and we interviewed them. We took their story verbatim. And then, Lou, you want to go into the process we follow from there? To yeah, the, the, um, the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, has an unbelievable inventory of thousands of tapes 
of Holocaust survivor stories. And indeed, we interviewed all of these people individually, uh, but we they were old people. We wanted to make sure it was accurate. We accessed the uh, the tape collection that Steven Spielberg has has put in into that museum in the Shoah Center, and we we sat and listened to hours and hours and hours of the interviews they had given to the Spielberg people, and we cross checked it against what we did to make sure that it was fairly accurate. Um, and if I can take a second to, to so you get the impact, uh, there was uh, a man who I actually knew uh, who was a Holocaust survivor. I met him uh, in our building. Uh, we both loved history. And he asked me why I liked German history. And I asked him why he liked German history. And he told me that when he was eight years old, he stood behind the drapes in Munich on Kristallnacht. So that caught my attention. And, and he has told his story many times. He's, he's no longer with us, but, but his story, to tell you the key part of it, just imagine this, a nine or 10 year old boy, his parents had enough money to get him out of Germany. This is right at the month of Kristallnacht. And they were going to the Netherlands. Uh, they had moved business over to the Netherlands and they get to the Netherlands border and the German troops say to the parents, you have your passports, you can go, but we need your twin sons to go to the work camp to be workers. And his mother pulls a knife out of her purse and puts it against his throat and says to the German soldiers, I'd rather kill him than let him go to a slave camp. Yeah. That's the kind of stories we're talking about. That's what we want teenagers and college kids and, and people in their 20s to understand that when anti-Semitism gets out of hand, we're talking about a choice between killing your son or letting him go to a camp where he dies. Yeah, Irvin, if I may add one thing, if you can go back to that picture of the parade, of the demonstration, there are two things I'd like to point out. Uh, back, uh... The one of the, that's right here. Yeah. If you take a look at this picture here, what's so frightening about it is not the Confederate flag and not the people marching, uh, chanting Nazi slogans or the gentleman carrying a Nazi shield in front of the flag. What's very frightening about this picture, this was a change from what Nazism had been in the United States. Prior to this, the only people who showed up at Nazi rallies, what we called skinheads. These were the men shaved bald. They wore black muscle shirts. They had swastikas tattooed on their arms and one or two carried a Nazi flag. And every once in a while, they'd stand at attention and give the Nazi salute. What you have here, looking at these pictures and others from that day, is this is middle-class America. These are the guys and gals who live next door. These are not the muscle bound guys who, who get high and go out and said, let's find something and, you know, let's find a Jew and beat him up. These are responsible adults and 600 showed up here. If 600 showed up here, you have to think how many more people must be going with that. The second thing, if I may, Luke, the second thing I want to bring up, when Lou mentioned the mother slitting the throat, Going back to this woman, Hani, who called me, we took their stories because the students that we are working with can relate to them. Quick story, she was a, had a single parent. They were living in Rudersheim, Germany. She was with her grandmother. The roundup came. They were put on a train and sent to France because they had no more room in the East. They put them on a regular passenger train to France. Her grandmother sitting next to him has a nervous breakdown. She's crying, she's screaming. She sees sitting in front of her on the train is the family doctor. And she says to the family doctor, help grandma, give her something. And he looks around and he reaches into his pocket and he gives her a bottle and says, have her take all of these and have her take it now. And Hanny goes back and she looks at the bottle and it says sleeping pills. And Hanny always says there are seven blue pills in this bottle what do I do? 
And she thought about it. And you know what she did? She gave grandma the sleeping pills. Grandma fell asleep. She was holding her, rocking her back and forth. And Hanny fell asleep. An hour later when Hanny woke up, grandma was alive. The pills didn't work. But here's the story of a 17-year-old girl because of the Holocaust, because what was done to them, has to make a decision, should I let my grandmother live or should I let my grandmother die? And when I ask students that question, they don't know how to respond because they've never had to make a situation. And that's what really connects with the students in our program. If, 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 if I can relate this, you had said something earlier when you introduced the thing and, and how relevant this all is, this moment in time. And something people on, on the uh, cast here may or may not know, but one of the major uh, theoretical underpinnings of, of Hitler's Nuremberg laws uh, was eugenics. If you don't know what eugenics is, eugenics uh, is a way to take survivor the fittest and you enhance in the creation of, of the good people, the better people, and you use involuntary sterilization and gas chambers to get rid of the bad people. And, and this was, lest you think this is an offbeat thing by a bunch of crazy Germans under Adolf Hitler, eugenics had its formation in New York City. And it was basically led by the leaders of the American Museum of Natural History and the leaders of the Bronx Zoo. And the people who, as Artie was saying, when you look at this, you're not talking about skinheads, you're talking about Harvard grads. What I'm talking about with eugenics, the people who supported it were named Alexander Graham Bell and John D. Rockefeller Jr. and Henry Cabot Lodge and Theodore Roosevelt. The better people in this country, and one of the first things they did in 1924 is they shut off the immigration to this country in an intention to stop the Jews and the Italians from coming in. And that is so relevant because in this political campaign, without getting into partisanship here, people are once again talking about the better people, the, the poison people, the poison in our blood. This is all extraordinarily current today. And we feel that if we can't get the word out to young people as to what this means in real terms to them, it's going to happen again. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a quote in the book from Noam Chomsky, Noam Chomsky says, education is not memorizing that Hitler killed six million Jews. Education is understanding how millions of ordinary Germans were convinced that it was required. So education is about how to spot, spot the signs of history repeating itself. Do you think there's a fear of history repeating itself again? Yeah, let, 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 me, let me start off on that. Uh, we all know about the history of the Holocaust, and we all say we're in America, it's okay. We, we don't have to worry about that. So just let me bring up a few things. Prior to 1940, in the United States, uh, the Ku Klux Klan me membership was four and a half million members, four and a half million. And they had a strong anti-Semitic program, not a very violent one, but most of the time uh, we hate Jews. And it was accepted that congressmen, senators would join the Klan. That's, that's what took place in their particular thing. But what we found more frightening when we looked at that, if you were a German citizen living in the United States, or you had a background, your parents came from Germany, you came from Germany, and you wanted your children to have the same experience that the boys and girls in Germany were having with Hitler in charge, you could get on the Long Island Railroad, which leads from Penn Station, and take that for two hours to Yaphank, Long Island, which is one of the outer uh, boroughs of New York. And when you get there, you get off the train, you're at Camp Siegfried. And Camp Siegfried was one of 12 camps set up by the American German Bund, which was the code name for the American Nazi party. And there, if you had your, your children in camp that summer, they learned everything that was taking place in Germany that boys and girls their age were going to take as, as 
This is what I did during the summer. They learned hatred. That they learned how to react to people. Uh, they learned the philosophy that the Jews are evil, that America is a haven for Jews, and it shouldn't be. And one of the things, when that, when that thing comes up, people we found were looking at it and saying, yeah, but World War II is over. We, we took care of the Nazis. Let, let's go on from there. But going on from there, we found when we did our research that from the end of World War II into the 50s and 60s, there was something like a golden age of Judaism in the United States. Anti-Semitism didn't disappear. It receded. Israel was formed. Synagogues sprouted up in the suburbs. I remember uh, we didn't live in the suburbs. We lived in part of New York City. But the very fancy thing that the synagogue we belonged to said, we have a shul with a pool. You know, and that became you, you, the kids went there, the grandchildren went there, they went to nursery school there, they grew up, they belonged to AZA, BBYO, and all these things had a very, very pleasant experience. And when we as parents sent our kids off to college, after we found the college, we liked their roommate and everything, we made one concern Is there a hill ale? Because you wanted them to know that they're on campus, they could meet other Jewish men and women there, you know, and have this relationship that no longer exists, that no longer exists. Uh, I know, look, I'm a grandfather, but I know when I speak to my other friends, they tell me their kids are sending their grandchildren off to college and they're thinking, is this school safe for Jews? Has never come up before, has never come up. And what Lou and I did in researching this is to say, we have to take the Holocaust and make it useful, not just figures, six million Jews, a million and a half died at Auschwitz, Theresienstadt. We have to say the Holocaust was a hate crime, and we put together a program that teaches students what a hate crime is. So when we put our program together, the very first part of the program is you get an intense history of European Jewry, and then we bring it up to the current day. And then after that, they interview survivors, they get to know them, they get the stories. The second part is this. The second part that we bring into the program is a semester dedicated to hate crimes. What is a hate crime? And we have people from the New York City Police Department come in, people from B'nai B'rith, people from LGBTQ come in and tell them what a hate crime is, present stories to them, actual cases. We work with the district attorney's office and having their attorneys come in and explain what a hate crime is and present redacted cases to them for students to learn. And what you see happening when they talk about hate crimes you can look out at your students and you suddenly realize this look of recognition on a student's face that, hey, that happened to me. And they didn't know it was a hate crime. So what we do is make them realize what a hate crime is. And the next step for graduation from the program is, what do you do as a victim of a hate crime? Do you go home and cry? Do you go home to your parents and say, look what happened to me? Or are there governmental agencies private agencies you can go to to take action against the people. That's what makes our program different. It's not just learning facts and figures and philosophies. It's teaching them a certain behavior of what to do if you're a victim, which is something the Jews never had. Lou, if I could follow up on that. Um, so we have people targeting Jews today. How did the Nazis get their collaborators to target Jews? whether they were German and Polish? Well, first of all, we have to get past the fact of thinking it was just the Germans uh, who did it. Uh, one of the things that we found, and I'll get to your question quickly, but before I do it, I just point, when, when I was in high school and learning history, I learned that in 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, through the Jews and the Muslims, 
We only learn that because of Columbus, but we all learn it, and we all learn that they were, and Spain became Christian again. I'll bet everybody who's watching this tonight knows that. And I'll bet nobody who's watching this tonight knows that the English did exactly the same thing in the 1350s. So we're talking within the lifespan of someone who might have watched them sign the Magna Carta, which we all hold up as a celebration of freedom, the same country threw the Jews out you know, 70 some years later. Why did they do it? Because the blood libel rumors had said that the Jews were responsible for the plague, which had occurred, you know, throughout Europe. Now, I'm not telling you that that happened in England. It happened in France too. And it happened in Poland. Poland, the Poland-Lithuanian uh, group uh, was one group who took Jews and, and, and they were very proud about the fact that they, they uh, that's why there were so many millions of Jews there. But there's another reason they were there, because the Russians and the Austrians and the Prussians uh, used to put the Jews in an area called the Pale of Settlement, which was that area which is sort of west part of Russia and in the east part of what is Poland. And uh, the, the viewing of Jews as others, the hatred, uh, Jews, for example, in England and France and Germany and po well, Poland after a while and Austria, were not allowed to own property. They were not allowed to go into a higher education. They were not allowed to be in certain professions. And one of the reasons that they went into a very narrow group of professions is they couldn't go into other professions. Indeed, for quite a while, my, when I did research in my grandfather's heritage in Poland, you can only go back, if any of you are trying to do that through Ancestry.com, you can only go back into around the 1700s because Jews didn't have last names. They weren't allowed to. And the reason everybody was Abraham, the son of Joseph, is because there weren't any last names. And then finally, they were given last names uh, for tax purposes in the 1770s. And what I'm trying to do is not bore you with history, but to tell you that this has been happening again and again and again and again. And so when you ask the key question, which has haunted me, how could the Germans have done this? You also have to ask the question, how could the Poles have done this? And how could the Hungarians have done this? You know, in Hungary, as I'm sure you're aware, the, uh, in the beginning, the Nazis didn't really invade Hungary. Hungary was an ally. And the Jews were somewhat protected in Hungary until 1944, when the Germans knew they were losing, and they worked with the Hungarians and murdered 450,000 Jews in six months. In, in, in Greece, in Salonika, Greece, one of the people we interviewed was telling us that uh, Salonika has the highest percentage of death rate of any large Jewish community. I didn't even know Greeks had Jews in, in that age. And, and, and so the question, your, your question if I now can reformulate it for you is how did all of Europe let this happen? All of Europe. Jews did not get to Auschwitz on trains that were driven by robots. They got to Auschwitz on trains that were driven by people. And they were loaded onto those trains driven by people. And, and if you get to understand the reality, one of the chapters, which I would encourage everyone to read, is a chapter of Georgine Hyde. I knew Georgine Hyde. I was the executive director of the School Boards Association, which was all the school boards in New York State. Georgine was the chairman. But Georgine had spent two years in Theresienstadt and two years in, in Auschwitz as a young teenager. And, and she told these stories how she was on this train, the real Dr. Mengele. Joseph Mengele actually stood there and said, go that way to her mother who died that night in a gas chamber and go that way to you, young girl, you'll be a slave for us. These things really happened to teenagers and they happened in my lifetime. We're not talking about 1300. So the question we have to ask is how can this happen? How can human beings treat each other this way? And, and the only answer I can give you is they don't connect it. They don't really think this is happening. Yeah. Georgine told me when, when the Russian troops let Auschwitz be free, she went across the street to a house and said, I'm from the death camp across the street. And the woman who had smelled all of the, those bodies going up said, there is no death camp across the street. We, the rest of society tends to be in denial. And unless we work hard to educate them on what this means, it's going to happen again. 
Now, there's, if I may, there's one other part that has to be connected, what Lou said, and that is the United States. And, you know, United States has always been looked upon as the land of the free and the home of the brave. It's the melting pot that produces this new type of human being. But if you go back in American history, um, I, I was very surprised at this. The first American anti-Semite, least known, but the first American since 1654, New Amsterdam, colony of New York, it's a company set up by the Dutch West India Company, is Peter Stuyvesant. Peter Stuyvesant was the governor of New Amsterdam. Uh, he had, he was known as Old Peg Leg because he had a wooden leg, but he was looked upon as being very cantankerous and very anti-Semitic. And when a shipload of 23 Jews who were leaving Recife, Brazil in 1654 got lost in a storm, they made it to New Amsterdam. He came in, the Jews arrived, there was a dispute with the captain and Peter Stuyvesant was told, uh, told the Jews, leave, get out. We don't want you. We don't care where you go. We're kicking you out. They contacted through letters the Dutch West India Company on the colony. A lot of Jews invested money in the Dutch West India Company. And Stuyvesant was told, let them stay. He didn't take it well. And what happens in the next chapter is the following year, he puts out a thing, an announcement saying, Jews are not allowed to stand guard at night for the colony. Everybody else was, Jews have to pay to hire someone to do the guard work. And we all know the famous name, Asher Levy, brought a lawsuit against him. And again, the Dutch West India Company voted against him. And Stuyvesant was, was just a very, very virulent anti-Semite. What, what's so unusual about it is the best high school in New York City that children struggle to get into and are tutored in them is Stuyvesant High School. Right. Peter Stuyvesant was the first one there. And the second thing we want to point out that we do in the book is the concept of the melting pot. There's this theory that in the United States, when people came over, immigrants came over, it was like putting them all in one pot, stirring it up. And when you pour it out, you have this wonderful thing called the new American. Except one of the things we found out is that <laughs> Lou and I say that the, the founders of our country who came up with this idea of the melting pot may have been great statesmen, but not good cooks, because they tell you when you make a stew, whatever rises to the top, skim off and get rid of, because if you mix it up, it spoils the dish. And so the feelings that they had from Europe also became part of the American culture. So so if I may, so part of the question I was asking about collaborators, since the book is how others, the collaborators targeted uh, the Jews. So, so today, the question being is, are Jews being targeted? Uh, and we had a couple of comments in the chat that what you described is happening in Europe today. So the question I want to ask is, are Jews being targeted uh, differently than other groups that, that, that have been at, whether they're Blacks or women or LGBTQ? Are Jews being targeted differently? Is the hate against Jews the same as hate against others? Or is there something different about anti-Semitism different from other forms of hate. Lou, what, what, how could you say? I, I would argue it's both. There's a lot of similarity. The ways, for, forget the slavery thing, the way blacks were treated after slavery is very much the way Jews were treated. Neither one could own property, neither one could vote, neither one could go to schools. There's differences because there are differences in why you hate them. Uh, one of the things that amazes me, I was thinking about your earlier question, how could the Germans do this? Uh, when I was growing up, it was quite common in the 50s for people to say, don't buy a Volkswagen Adolf Hitler designed that. Uh, people would say, don't buy a Mercedes, they made the gas chambers. I never heard anyone say, don't buy a Ford. 
And yet, I don't know how many people who are watching us know this, but one of the great anti-Semites in American history was Henry Ford. If you bought a Model T or a Model A, you got sitting on the front bench of your car a book about the criminality of Jews. And the Protocols of Zion was, was included with it. And he paid, he put out a newspaper which was aimed at eradicating Jews. Indeed, most of us don't know that Henry Ford's picture was in Adolf Hitler's office as, as a hero. And, and that goes to your question. How do we just write that out? This is no secret about Henry Ford. Everyone knows that about Henry Ford today, but no one talks about it. And it's part of what I mentioned earlier. We tend to see what we want to see. And so are Jews being treated the same? They're certainly being treated different than, um, than the Native Americans, you know, the indigenous folk, but they're being treated exactly the same way in, in more nascent stages as the Japanese were treated. I mean, in, in World War II, the Japanese were put into concentration camps. Actually, Franklin Roosevelt used the word concentration camp, which I didn't know to we researched this book, and and uh, which is one of the chapters in the book uh, we we call Lebensraum. If you know what that means, you know, living room as they were going to take Eastern Europe and and make it in German, uh, or manifest destiny, because Adolf Hitler, yes, Adolf Hitler used to give speeches in the 1920s holding up the way America treated the indigenous people as the way he wanted to treat the Slavic people and the Jewish people in Eastern and Central Europe. How, there's a common hate crime aspect. What is more shocking to me about the Jews as I look at the history is how long it's lasted. It comes and goes, but it's been here for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and I'm not talking about the Christ killing aspect of it. I'm talking, I mean, how did the Jews ever get blamed for the plague? You know, how, how did that ever happen? And how could millions of people just buy into that? And, and today, watching people talk about eugenics, talk about poisoning of the blood. The term poisoning of the blood comes from Nazi terminology. How could people be using that and talking about immigrants today? And why isn't America angrier about it? Why aren't we saying, no, no, you can't talk about us that way? There, there is another aspect to, to what Lou is saying, and that is that after World War II, as I said earlier, anti-Semitism in the United States seemed to recede, never disappeared, but it seemed to recede. And now what we're seeing is not only has it risen, but it's acceptable for people to make anti-Semitic statements. Uh, for example, just this past week, a member of Congress uh, talked about uh, the, the hurricanes hitting Florida and said George Soros is responsible for helping direct those hurricanes over states which were not supportive of the party. Uh, another candidate for office said, if I lose this election, It'll be because of the Jews. Now, these were statements that we you know we may have been hushed. People would say that to their friends because they knew they had the same philosophy. But now it's set out in the open. Uh, the same person who talked about George Soros said the reason that uh, wildfires were occurring in Florida was because George Soros and the Rothschilds uh, controlled this Jewish space laser which was burning the forest. That was bad enough. But after, after this program tonight, sit down in front of your computer and go to Amazon and type in Jewish space laser and see how many different articles they sell, T-shirts, sneakers that have insignias on and saying Jewish space laser. And sneakers they feel free to do it. Sneakers right. with swatch stickers. So. Yeah. So if I may, uh, because we have only a little time left and a couple more questions. Um, in the book you wrote about um, uh, training or looking at young people who can keep the survivor stories alive and a uh, project Queensborough College. If our faith, if our hope is going to be in our young people, um, how do we have them understand what anti-Semitism is when this group, especially the uh, those who are Gen Z, uh, 
born between 96 and 2012, they look on all kinds of things from aspect of physical insecurity. This generation has known nothing but mass shootings at schools. This generation has known nothing but threats on social media. So how do you think we can help, we can support where younger people understand the stories of these survivors and can relate them to today? Let, let, let me answer in my own terms. I grew up in West Virginia. I graduated high school in 1962. Why did I spend most of my career playing with civil rights and trying to, to make people who were second class have more opportunities? Because I read a book that came out when I was in high school called To Kill a Mockingbird. And I wanted to be Atticus Finch. Now, of course, I now realize in retrospect that Atticus Finch may have been racist himself. But, but in terms of, of the book, that book had that kind of powerful impact on me. And I believe in education, and I believe in our young people. And I believe if we can get our young people to understand what this means and how important it is to treat each other with tolerance, and more important, to stand up and stop other people from treating them with intolerance. There's a uh, Lord Burke, uh, you know, the, the British uh, you know, philosopher, and uh, most important thing that was ever said in political science was, and I believe we end the book this way, is uh, for evil to happen, good men have only to be silent. Yeah, uh, Irv, let, let me, you, you raise a question, what do we do with our students? Uh, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Uh, one morning I showed up to my office and standing in front of the office at 7.30 in the morning, I'm an early riser, is one of the boys, uh, without get, mentioning his name, He's standing there and he's shaking. Uh, he's 21 years old. He wears a yarmulke and he says, I have to talk to you. And I said, what's up? We sat down and I said, uh, what are you so upset about? He said the other night on the weekend, he was coming out of the movies with his friend. Uh, the two boys, they're in their early 20s. Uh, he, they both wear yarmulkes. And if you looked at this young fellow, let's call him Joe, he is so thin and looks so frail that if you sneezed, he would blow over. He said they're walking in the parking lot towards the car, and one of the people yell out, hey, Jew boy. And he says, I just kept going. He said, the next thing, I got hit in the head with a can of soda. He said, I is nothing I could do. I could not turn around. And we ran into the car and we got in the car and we drove away. And he said, I want you to tell me you were in the hate crimes program. What can I do? I said, well, the first thing you do is you go to 103rd Precinct, which is 10 blocks away. See the community relations officer. Tell him you came in from me. Tell him what happened. OK. And he did. He swore out a complaint, and a week later, they found these two boys in that parking lot in the movies. That's where the hangout was, harassing people, and they arrested them, okay? They, they were given community service. But he felt good because he knew there was something that can be done and someplace where to go and what to do. He would have been much happier if they gave him the electric chair but you can't do that. But the idea that there's something to do, there's a person to go to, there's an organization that could help you rather than go home. I, I was raised uh, in my family, the understanding was don't get involved. Whenever there was a family get together, the whole family came from Poland. I'm first generation. And they told a joke. And the joke had a moral to it. And the joke they told us was there was an old Jewish jury on a murder case. And the, after the, all the evidence was presented, the jury was sent off to deliberate. And one day passes, two day passes, three day pass, and the judge doesn't hear anything. And the judge goes into the jury room and sees them sitting there. And Mr. Greenberg, the head of the, 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 head of the jury, is sitting there just looking off into space 
Other people are playing cards. Others are talking. He said, you were supposed to come to a decision. What is it? He said, we did make a decision. He said, what's the decision? The decision is we decided not to get involved. Okay. We were brought up with that because that's what they brought from Europe. What we do is say, this is the U.S. But there's one thing I want to add. It's uh, dealing with anti-Semitism in the United States is a very, very tenuous situation. I'll explain why. When I used to do presentations about the Holocaust and people's reaction to it, I would always end it by saying and giving them a warning. I would say, those people who were living in Europe in the 1930s who looked at Adolf Hitler and said, this would be a passing thing. It happens to us Jews every once in a while, then it goes away. I say, those people went to Auschwitz. Those people who said, wait a minute, we have to do something about this. They came to New York City. I don't use that anymore. And what I do is tell them the very last lesson that I teach the class, and it comes off exactly the same every time. We come in, they've had a semester of Holocaust history, a semester of Holocaust hate law, and I say to them, this is our last session, and I have some good news for you. Yesterday, I got a call from the president of the college. He wanted to see me. He said he wanted to talk about the students in the internship program. He, he, so I came up, I went to his office, and I have to tell you, none of this ever happened. I said, the president asked me to come in, sit down. He knows all of you. He's been following you. He wants you to help him on a special project that he has. And everybody looked forward. The president of the college wants me to help him. Wonderful. And this will go on your records. You could use it. And I said, the president feels there's a certain group of people on campus who don't belong here. And when I said that, every time I say that, two or three students sit there shaking their head. Yeah, we know who you mean. I never mentioned the name, but he wants you to help them come up with a program of identifying these students and tracking them. So I'm dividing this class of 12 into three groups of four, come up with the program. First hand goes up, can we use our computers? Yes. And after 45 minutes, I said, okay, what do we have? And here's what they came up with. We got to get a list of their names, addresses, phone numbers, social security, their religion, who their parents are, where their parents work. Okay, have they had any trouble with the police? Have they had any trouble on campus? And one person was smart enough to say, and we should have a special section there where anybody wants to register a complaint about them could do it. And I stopped them. I said, does this at all sound familiar to you? And they're looking around. We're, we're setting up lists of people. We're tracking people, who they are, their religion, where they work, their parents. And, and one student suddenly realizes, yeah, it's the Holocaust. I said, so after studying the Holocaust one year, how come nobody here, not one single person, and this happened every year I did it, not one single person has said, it's the Holocaust. Why are we doing this? Why are you making us do this? And they look at each other and they look at me and they were really ticked off. They were ticked off at themselves, but they were ticked off at me that because I had tricked them. And I said, why didn't anybody say anything? And you know what the first answer always is? Well, Dr. Flu, you told us to do it. I said, yes, you were following orders, right? I told you to do that. And whenever I say that, it's like, oh my God, what did I do? That's how tenuous it is dealing with the Holocaust and Holocaust education. Because these students, pride of, pride of the college, they knew everything about the Holocaust. They interacted with government agencies that do it. And, and in like two minutes, they were organizing another Holocaust. Uh, That's the issue. Very, very, very illuminating story. Uh, Lou, we have time for one last question before we have to adjourn. Um, you all interviewed several survivors uh, for the book. 
are the memories of their experiences fading from the memories of the world? Um, all of my family who survived, they're all past now. While I remember them, is the world forgetting the memories of these survivors? Despite the fact we have the Holocaust Museum, we have Holocaust Museums everywhere, we have Yad Vashem. When they do surveys of uh, younger people, uh, let's say 30s or younger, you know, where half of them either have not heard of the Holocaust or don't realize it. So are the memories of these people that you and, and uh, Arthur interviewed, are they fading from the memory of the world? They're more than fading. They're, they're basically gone. When we talk about the Holocaust Museum, which is one of the great places in the world, those of us who go there self-select to go there. Those who go to Vaj Yashem, they, they self-select to go there. The millions and millions of people who haven't a clue what we're talking about here, it's our obligation to refresh memories and to tell them about these people. Every one of these people we interviewed said, please tell our stories. Because we kept saying, do you want us to talk about these things that happened to you? Please tell our stories. Because no one knows what they are. And, and I have taken this book and I've given it to several teenagers you know, to read. And it's fascinating to then talk to them because these are very bright, straight A, you know, student uh, people. They read Anne Frank. They didn't have a clue that there were 500,000 Anne Franks. They thought, you know, and I jokingly said, I hate to joke about this. She had a good publisher. I mean, she had a good PR person. But the people I'm talking about had the same story she did. Every one of them. I mean, this this one woman that uh, that we interviewed who spent two years in the Polish forest, never meeting another person, hiding from everybody, eating berries. Two years. And, and I think, and I have a lot of faith in young people. I think if we can somehow take it upon ourselves to get them this information in a form that they can understand it in, I think we can make a difference. If we all sit around and say, oh my goodness, what can we do about this? Let's not create a fuss. It's going to happen again. Uh, in those words, I thank you both uh, very much for the time. Um, I do encourage everyone to um, uh, to to purchase the book. It's on Amazon. So Untermenschen, uh, Untermenschen, uh, Subhuman is the is the title by uh, Arthur Flug and Lou Grumet. Uh, we appreciate that uh, you've uh, you've joined us. <clears throat> There's much to think about uh, what you have said, and the FJMC. <laughs> We'll continue to look at these so that we get our members involved, look at what we can do for the next generation. Um, and and despite all that we've tried, anti-Semitism is still there. Um, we will all do what it is that, that we can to combat it. So I want to thank you both again for joining us and for all of you. Uh, thank you. MC and visitors and friends and family. Uh, there were a number of K-Hands and Flukes who I saw on the list there. So it's a nice uh, family and that you're here. Um, thank you all very much. And again, a, a sweet and safe new year is what we're saying now these days. Um, and, and a good fast to, to all. And anytime you need us, uh, Lou and uh, Arthur, please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, the, a recording will be available of this uh, session. For those of you that uh, know others who weren't able to make it, um, please look for it in the FJMC toolkit that will be coming up. And again, thank you everybody for joining us. Lou, Arthur, thank you. And Alan, thank you as well.